Church that meets here at Maldon. We're glad each one of you here with us. And to our visitors, we want to know your honored guest. I hope each one of you picked up a bulletin. I'm not going to roll the things in the bulletin. I still remember our shut ins that's in the bulletin are sick. Also, let's remember Deborah Clark. She's going to be having surgery January the 24th. And I'm going to say one other thing. I just heard that found out this this afternoon. The one that's in there, John Mosley, some friends of ours. You know, he was in the automobile accident Thanksgiving Day. He came home from the hospital today. Good. But he's still got a long road to recovery, but at least he's home. So, I don't know. And also into our worship service tonight, our song leader be Joel Foster, our lesson by Dennis Strine, our closing prayer by Joe Mormon. And we'll begin our worship service with opening prior to me with Joel Foster. <coughs> Bow with me, please. Father, we're so thankful for this, another opportunity to come together and to worship you, to commune with one another, to build one another up, to open your word and study it, learn things that we can take and apply to our lives. Father, we're grateful for the news that Brother Dale just mentioned. We pray for others that are sick. Pray that you would continue to strengthen them be with the doctors and the medical personnel that work with them to help them to recover and improve. We know you have the power, Father, and if it is your will, we ask that they be restored to their health. We have shut-ins and such that are, are unable to get out, Father, and we pray that you would continue to put your place your peace upon them, that hopefully many of them we will see very soon. We're thankful, Father, for this rain. We had a stretch last year that was very dry, and we are appreciative of the rain to 
be able to back the water tables and the things that we need so that we're not in a drought condition. We pray your continued blessings. We complain when it's hot. We complain when it's cold. We complain when it's wet. We complain when it's dry. This is the nature of the human, Father, and we pray that you will forgive us for our failures and be more thankful for your blessings that you offer us. We pray for this church, Father, and the church the world over that we will stand and be lights for your truth so that others might say, I want to be a part of that, that we can proclaim your gospel throughout the area. And we pray for our mission fields that we work with, Father, that much success will continue in those areas as well. Our first responders and our military, our uh, personnel that uh, in emergencies that step forward, medical personnel and such, we pray for them that you would keep them safe. We pray for our leaders, Father, for our politicians, for our judges, those that we pray that that are in the leadership, that they will do things that are in accordance with your word and that you will defeat them in those things which are contrary to your word. Father, we pray for those that are not able to get out tonight because of the weather. We pray your, your blessings upon them as well. We pray now that you'd be with us in this service, be with Brother Dennis as he comes before us and presents our message, that we will open our minds and Take those things and use them in the upcoming week. We pray that you will be with all of us as we sing, that we can truly teach and admonish one another, we can build one another up in our songs, that we're not just doing something because it's a tradition or whatever, but we are truly paying attention to the words of the songs and trying to learn from them and build one another up. Be with us, Father. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Two nine nine. Two nine nine. <coughs> I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he can love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever be. How marvelous, how is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. In pity angels beheld him and came from the world of light to comfort him in the song. He bore for my soul that night. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my soul. And suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, 
and my soul shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see, will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Seven, six. Seven, six. <clears throat> Bless be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The Star. 
He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna, he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. cold, damp, and miserable as it is, I'm really glad you all are here tonight. I really am. If you will, mark in your Bible, Second, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And tonight we'll be starting in verse 17 in a moment. We need to make and face facts that there are people out there in this world who do not like how we live, what we believe or what we teach. They don't like the examples we try to set because it embarrasses them. But if we are going to work hard to be as close to God's message as possible and to work hard at walking in his paths, Society itself and all of its influences will find us intolerant. We do not like their simple attitudes. We do not like the influence that they give to this generation. They call it normal. They call it enlightened. But it's not normal. And it certainly isn't enlightened. And before we get to chapter 2 and 3 of 1 Thessalonians, I want you to listen to a few verses first. The first one is in 1 Peter. It's chapter 4 and verses 12 and 13. And Peter writes, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes to upon you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And the second one is 2 Timothy 3, verses 12 and 13. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. I don't care who you are. I don't care what life you walk in this world today. You want to have difficult times. You can be the kindest, the most blessed person on the face of the earth, and you are going to experience difficult times. Every one of us has experienced pain. We have all have suffered because of something else in this world that is evil. But it is God's message to us that if we choose, if we choose to follow him, then we need to expect some degree of hatred in this world. There is the adage that people love darkness rather than light. And I don't say that of all people, but there are a lot of folks out there that do. And I'm not talking about daytime and nighttime. 
I'm talking about good versus evil. They don't want our light to shine on them because it exposes them on who they are. The world would not accept Jesus and they killed him. The world would not accept the apostles' teachings and they killed them. What should we expect if we look like the characteristics of Christ and teach the same things that the apostle taught us. You know, part of what made the first century church such a tight-knit group of people was because they needed each other. They leaned on each other in both the good times and the difficult times. In Hebrews chapter 11, that great faith chapter, it concerned people in the Old Testament. Some of them had died for their faith. And they could only hope for what we have in Jesus Christ. In chapter 12, the Hebrew writer continues by telling us to keep our eyes on Christ. Because he suffered, that he is now seated on the right hand of God. And then we get two verses in Hebrews chapter 12 that speaks very clearly to many of us. Verses 3 and 4. Consider who? Consider him who endured from sinners against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin, that you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. We don't like it when we're mocked. We don't like how we're portrayed in the media. But that's nothing compared to what these brethren faced. Jesus had told us that the thief comes to kill and destroy. John tells us that Satan was a murderer from the very beginning. Paul says that Satan's angels can appear as angels of light to deceive man. Peter says that Satan is like a lion, is prowling around seeking those that he can devour. We face these things every single day in our lives. Evil and sin. And there are times where we are under the direct attack by these evil forces. That is one of the reasons Paul was writing to this young church in Thessalonica. He was fearful that Satan would continue his attacks on them. And that because of those attacks, that they would fall away from their faith. But in his letter, he reveals that he is happy to hear that that wasn't the case. And he tells them, and when he tells them, it is also a message to us. That Satan wants to hinder anything that is of God. We have to look at how he went to work in that church. First thing that he did was get to their source of spiritual teaching. They got him away from that. Let's look in chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians, starting in verse 17 and reading to the end of that chapter. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Now I have no idea, and the Bible doesn't tell us what battles that Paul had with Satan. 
But Paul says that he was hindered by Satan from coming to them. It was Calvin who wrote and kind of gives us an idea. One of the few things that Calvin wrote that I agree with. For whenever the wicked molest us, they fight under Satan's banner. And they are his instruments for harassing us. So wherever Paul was at, it was the people around them that prevented him from coming when he wanted to come. But we talk a lot and encourage our fellowship and our gathering together in services for a specific reason. Isolation is one of the great tools that Satan uses to weaken our faith. When he can get us away from each of us, we have no one to encourage us, no one to watch over us, no one to kind of nudge us away from the temptations we may be facing. The less time that we spend with God and with his family, the more likely we're able to stumble and fall and lose our faith. Satan's goal with the church at Thessalonica was to isolate them from good teachers like Paul. But they couldn't outwit Paul. Because Paul sent Timothy. He sent Timothy there to strengthen them. I like to think that while Paul was trying to skirt around Satan, I like to think that Paul was a lot smarter than Satan. But what we do know is that these Christians were not spiritually left alone. The second thing that Satan helped to do was to orchestrate the persecution that they were facing. Now, it may not be Satan himself, but it may be those who love to do evil, those who like to accomplish Satan's goals because they hate God so much. Now, let's look at verses 3 and 5 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. That no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction. Just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith. For fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. <coughs> When we are alone, when life becomes difficult because of our faith, quitting seems to be the better option. Maybe most of us at one time or another, myself included, questioned if it was worth it. Why try to do everything right when nothing seems to go right? Some think it's just not worth it. Satan's number one goal is to get us to walk away from God. The persecution, the difficulties in life, the afflictions that we face will either drive us away from God or it will draw us closer to God. The first two verses of chapter 3 reads, Therefore we could bear it no longer. We were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker, in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith. That's what we need each and every day. That's why it is so important that we look after one another, not just on Sundays, but the other six days of the week. God's protection for this young church was the encouragement that was given by Timothy. 
And the point of this is that God, at times, protects us through the strength of others. Paul was very concerned that Satan had tempted them to walk away from their faith. We need to be involved in the lives of Christians, especially those who are relatively young in the faith. We don't realize it, but each of us here can be a Timothy. We can use what we have gained in our lives through our knowledge of the scriptures, through our enduring much of the same things that they're going through to give them strength to continue on in the journey. A lot of us lived in a different world than our young people live in today. But the only difference is is that it came slower because we didn't have the internet. We didn't have Facebook, TikTok, or, or any of these other things to get the message spread as quickly as possible. It was a lot slower, but it still came. We still had to deal with the same problems. When I was in school, I faced the same things that our young people face today. Many of us did, just on a different level. But there are those here to not that remember praying in school too. When that was taken away, that's where we started to go downhill. Those of us who have walked in Christ for many years, we have faced the tempter and we continue to remain strong, we can use the strength and the knowledge that we have gained to strengthen others. And the method that God gives is for the older ones to teach the younger ones. It's probably time for us to start teaching, to start encouraging, and strengthening one another. When Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, he truly understood the need to comfort them because of the difficulties that they were facing. Now, the words that we're going to use out of 1 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 7, I have used in several funerals. But it doesn't just pertain to that. For Paul writes, in, starting in verse 3, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. And if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken for we know that as you are share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comforts. Friends, we might just be the person that God wants to use to comfort others because we may have been blessed when someone else walked with us through those storms of life. Satan's mission is to take as many of us with him in his eternity 
as he can. Satan knows what his end will be. Don't fall for it. We'll close tonight with a reminder from the parable of the soul. Jesus explains to his apostles when they did not understand what Jesus was talking about. And he said that the seed is the word of God. And there were the different soils that were used to describe the hearts of men. <coughs> the hard pathway. The seed that was scattered on the pathway is the person's heart that is hard. And it's easy for the devil to snatch away the effect that God's word may have had. The second was the rocky soil. That when persecution comes because of the word, these Christians immediately fall away. And that was Paul's fear to the church at Thessalonica. The next was the thorns. The heart of people who were unproductive because the world was more important than the next world. In each case, Satan came and did his evil work. But we need to look into our hearts and to make sure that our hearts are planted in the good soil, a good productive soil, a soil that Satan can tug and pull, but he can never uproot us. That's what we need to be. Where are we this day, this very moment in time? What soil are we in? Are we in any soil? Are we just sitting here with the seed and not doing anything with it? Tonight you can make that choice and do something with the seed that God has given us his word. <clears throat> Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Now that faith and belief of being here tonight complete the mission. <coughs> Repent, confess, Put on Jesus Christ in New Testament baptism. Have your sins washed away. And together we grow. Together we strive for that reward. If there's anyone that has a need for the invitation this evening, won't you come as together we stand and we sing. Oh.
I don't believe there's anyone who did not have the opportunity to the Lord's Supper. Very good. Appreciate everyone being here tonight, and we hope you see you Wednesday night. Um, we really do appreciate it very much. This time we'll be dismissed with prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to meet together here today. We're always thankful for everything you bless us with. We're thankful for our home and our family, everything we're blessed with each day of our lives. We're blessed far beyond what many people in this earth are. are. We, we know that we are blessed in ways which many people are not. We're thankful for this nation that we live in, the freedom that we enjoy. We pray for those who are less fortunate than us the world over. Heavenly Father, we pray for the church that it meets in this place in the world, wherever they meet together. We pray for our missionaries, especially those that work in India at this particular time. They endure hardships which we may not know about. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the lessons we've heard this evening. We pray that we take it into our hearts. Use it to be better Christians and get up the very day of our lives. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for the health that we have. We pray for our members who are sick and not well. We pray for Sue Dill, as always, and Team Westmoreland. We pray for them. We pray for uh, Deborah and Rick and Ruth that, that they encountered her surgery this week. That she'll go to the well and recover once again. It is your will. We pray for strength for all those, Heavenly Father, that need it today. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to leave this place tonight and go our separate ways, we pray that you will be with us, uh, guide, guard us, and direct it always, that we might be good examples of your church, that mothers might be able to see what we live and be, be want to be part of it. We pray that you be with us now and bless us and care for us. Forgive us our many sins and we need this place together. We pray in strong and lovely day. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.